Good morning. Welcome to FTA's Transit Renewal Summit. To get us started, we are proud to introduce FTA Administrator Nuria Fernandez. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, welcome to FTA's National Transit Renewal Summit, highlighting the best nationwide practices from our transit agencies to help reinforce that America is open and transit is open. Throughout this summer, FTA facilitated a national conversation to highlight how transit agencies have kept transit open during the most significant public health crises in recent memory. As our country reopened this year, transit agencies unveiled a wide range of strategies to help their communities to be safe and ready for riders. FTA gathered ideas from three listening sessions, as well as meetings with transit leaders industry practices, and social media. Today is the culmination of all we have seen and heard. We will look more closely at successful practices transit agencies are using to renew ridership and show how in areas large, small, urban, and rural, you can adapt these best practices for use on our systems and how you can support both transit systems and your communities. This is particularly timely as we head into September when kids have returned or are soon to return to school and more agencies and businesses are reopening and calling back workers to be present in person. At FTA's listening sessions, we heard about many successful communication strategies to boost rider confidence. That is the first best practice we will discuss today. We'll zoom in to showcase ridership campaigns, for example, San Diego MTS created colorful, catchy posts on social media and connected with local media outlets and others in the community to spread its clean ride message. Rural transit agencies represented by the Community Transportation Association of America, CTAA, are also focused on ways to improve communication with customers who have continued to rely on transit as much or more throughout the pandemic. The second best practice will we will discuss is how transit agencies have taken a fresh look at their systems with an eye to review and redesign systems and adjust routes based on where customers want to go. One great example is Miami-Dade's Better Bus Program. They're improving accessibility by expanding into new areas as well as adopting enhanced technology. Agencies have also done impressive work to convey their safety improvements. The third best practice we learned from the FTA transit renewal listening sessions is communicating that transit is safe has been key to restoring public confidence and encouraging people to get on board. The system I regularly ride here in DC, WMATA, upgraded air filters at stations and facilities and are installing higher grade filters on buses and rail cars. You can learn more about that by watching WMATA's 30 second catchy video featured on our FTA America's Open and Transit is Open webpage. We also were reminded of the importance of partnerships to improve efficiencies, better address community needs, and address inequities as the fourth best practice. The Commuter Rail Coalition described a partnership between Metra and PACE in the Chicago area, funded by Cook County, that launched a fair transit program to reduce fares, integrate fare payment, and increase service. Finally, Thanks to participation by transit advocacy groups and city and county organizations focused on how to build back better to meet the needs of communities, our fifth best practice will demonstrate programs to improve equity and reduce greenhouse gases. We'll show how they are smart business decisions for transit systems. The National League of Cities told us about their report, three ways that cities can measure and tackle transportation equity which provides tools to measure commute time to highlight where improvements can be made. We have received a lot of great information and we certainly do appreciate the outpouring of ideas. Now we will take this to the next level. What best practices might transit agencies adopt to encourage riders to get on board? How might transit agency leaders re-envision their systems and serve to better serve all members of their communities? What opportunities does the post-pandemic future and the influx of new funding being provided by the federal government under the Biden-Harris administration it provide to improve transit and how do we build back better? For today's summit, 
we invited some of the 45 speakers who shared their time and brain power with us over the last three listening sessions. Today's speakers will address best practices to help transit agencies nationwide reach their goals. With that, okay. So with that, I will turn it now over to uh, Mr. Paul Kincaid. Thanks, Daria. My name is Paul Kincaid. I'm FDA and Associate Administrator for Communications and Congressional Affairs. And today I'll moderate four lightning round table discussions to elaborate on those ideas. I'm really looking forward to hearing the best of the best conversations from our three listening sessions. Also later, we'll show a brief video showcasing the many creative campaigns from our transit partners. Today, we've assembled an impressive list of speakers joining us from across the country. Several of them were with us for one of our previous listening sessions, and we invited them back to explore in a more fulsome conversation how to implement the practices that have been most effective in encouraging people to ride transit. We'd like to gather more detail so all of us who care about public transportation can take away the promising tools and strategies to adapt, put into practice, and discuss ideas that will provide more food for thought for the industry. I want to send a special thanks to all of FTA's regional administrators who co-hosted our previous listening sessions, including Peter Butler, Stephen Goodman, Terry Garcia-Cruz, Yvette Taylor, Kelly Brookins, Don Kosky, Cindy Terwilliger, Ray Tellis, and Linda Gerke. They're FTA's boots on the ground, and we encourage you to reach out to them with any questions that you might have. I also want to thank Dr. Nikki Cohen from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in Atlanta for joining all of our listening sessions. We greatly appreciate her time and know she's taking back some of the things we talked about to the leadership of the CDC, who are so valuable in helping us stop the spread of COVID-19 in our communities and throughout the transportation industry. Let's move on to our first panel discussion. I'm happy to have joining us today, Alex Wiggins, CEO of the New Orleans Regional Transit Authority, Euless Cleckley, Director and CEO of Miami-Dade County Department of Transportation and Public Works, Robbie Mackinnon, General Manager of the Kansas City Area Transportation Authority, and Sharon Cooney from the San Diego Metropolitan Transit System. Alex, let's start with you. We want to hone in on kind of the communications with your customers about reduced fare initiatives. How did you come up with the new Jazzy Pass fare policy, and how did you promote it? Hey, thank you, Paul. And we, great question. Uh, fantastic question. And actually, I want to you know begin really by just thanking uh, Administrator Fernandez and everyone at the FTA for facilitating these discussions. I found them to be incredibly in insightful. So what we experienced um, during the, the pandemic, the same experience as you know, our sister transit agencies across the country, uh, initially reduced ridership, reduced revenue. Um, but what we found as we started to emerge, as the vaccine became available early this year, uh, we were still operating at about 80% of our normal service levels. But our, our riders began to come back at a, at a pace actually much faster than we were prepared uh, for at the time. And so um, in July of this year, we decided to do a couple of different things. One is return to full service during our peak travel times, but then to further incentivize our riders to actually stay with us and continue to rely on us for, for their mobility needs. So we really looked at a campaign to temporarily reduce our transit fares and introduce a couple of new products as well. Uh, next slide, please. So we essentially in New Orleans had a very, and, and still have a very large population of cash paying customers. And we really wanted to move them into a monthly pass. And so we introduced a six month pilot that would actually reduce the cost of our monthly pass uh, from $55 to $45. And we also eliminated all transfers, all transfer fees, all express upcharges, and then made that uh, pass available on all modes of transit. Um, many of you know, in addition to streetcar and um, uh, bus service, we also operate uh, a ferry service. And so the ferry had been treated like a different um, uh, business line completely. We actually incorporated that into our full service. And so our monthly pass essentially works on all of our transit modes. Uh, and then we introduced a couple of new products that weren't available in New Orleans, a $14 a month senior monthly pass, which gives them mobility across the entire region. And then an $18 uh, dollar a month uh, youth pass to help you know, improve mobility for our young people. And our one day pass is 80 cents for seniors and $1 for youth. So what actually happened as a result of that? We've only seen, uh, we've only been doing this for a month. We've seen a month's worth of data. Our monthly pass sales have increased by 60%. 
and our day pass sales have increased by 71%. And so we're really excited about uh, this temporary fare reduction. And we're going to run this through the end of the year. And our ultimate goal is a lesson I learned from one of my colleagues in San Diego, Mr. Matt Tucker, is uh, we're always focused on increasing ridership and revenue. And so as we continue to emerge from COVID, uh, we're going to do everything we can to incentivize our, our riders. Now, uh, next slide, please. We also have to make sure that we maintain our ability to operate. Uh, we're all dealing with the fourth wave. We're all de dealing with the challenges related to the Delta variant. And so our board of directors, myself and my executive team, consulted with medical professionals. We looked at the data. We looked at what Delta was doing in New Orleans, in the South in general. We were mandating vaccine for all of our employees, operations, administrative, et cetera. And we, we found that our campaign to encourage voluntary um, uh, vaccination was effective, but not as effective as it should have been. And so we made this mandatory in July. And we're now at a point where 92% of our staff is either fully vaccinated or partially uh, vaccinated. And we allowed for a couple of exemptions, but we really took this step to, now that we have riders returning, we have a very affordable uh, pass system. We've got to maintain our ability to operate and maintain mobility in the face of this challenge with, with COVID. And so we're thinking that these strategies will help to improve mobility for the region and uh, keep the RTA moving forward. Thank you. And thank you, Alex. Those are some great ideas and, uh, and it's great to see that you're seeing such an increase in sales in those passes. I wanna move on now to my home state of Florida and we'll hear from Euless Cleckley from Miami-Dade. In our listening session, we learned about Miami-Dade's Better Bus Campaign, for those who didn't hear about it before. Euless, uh, if you could provide a, a brief summary of the program and let us know how and why you restructured your bus routes. Yes, uh, thank you, Paul. I appreciate it. And thank you to the FTA administrator and FTA staff for the opportunity to present to you today. Um, I'm newly minted in my position here. I've only been here for about two to three weeks, and uh, I'm definitely appreciative of the opportunity to talk about uh, the ways in which Miami-Dade and our transportation network is building a better bus network to be able to move people around more effectively. And so just to level set a little bit, uh, this Better Bus Network campaign is truly a community-driven effort. Uh, it was initiated uh, by a local advocacy group called Transit Alliance. And the effort began back in 2018 to really try to accomplish two things. One, to increase frequent service and the highest ridership corridors, and two, to maintain 15-minute frequency throughout today for all of our customers within the county. Uh, so there was an exercise to really figure out the right ratio between coverage and ridership, and we essentially have had a mix between 85% focused on ridership versus 15% focused on coverage to try to achieve the following result that's listed here which is really one to allow more residents within the county, uh, more than 350,000 residents uh, will be able to have 15 minute frequent service on our bus routes uh, as we move forward within a quarter mile of a bus uh, stop. And that's a significant increase from 10% that exists today. So we're going from 10% to 23% of our residents that have that high frequency service. Uh, also, uh, we have done a fantastic job with this uh, new system and having the ability to provide more access to 32% more jobs within 30 minutes for our residents. Um, and essentially trying to figure out the best way to have our transportation system solve the equity issue. Uh, we also have the opportunity for this network to have 28% of our residents living in poverty to have high frequent transit service as compared to existing network now. And again, transit is a great equalizer and figuring out a way to have our service provide more frequency to uh, uh, jobs in our local economy is extremely important. Where now we are having our network to be able to provide 175,000 additional jobs and access a high frequency network. So next slide. So that's the background of where we were. Now we uh, worked to get to a point where we're almost ready to actually officially adopt this program. 
We finalized uh, in February 2020 the final route plan, and then COVID hit again the next month, and so we've had to uh, be nimble and adjust, but essentially we are planning to reinstate uh, this better bus network uh, sometime later this fall at the beginning of uh, 2022. Uh, so here, the takeaway from this particular slide is that you can see the adjustment between what's on the left and what's on the right. What is on the left is our existing network, uh, where you see the red lines that represent the 15-minute frequencies. If you transition to what the new network will look like is uh, a significant increase in the number of routes that will provide 15-minute frequency bus service uh, throughout the county. As you, as you can see, by shifting to a more a balanced approach and a more approach that's focused on where the demand for the service is, we're able to provide better and more frequent service throughout the county. Next slide. Now, one aspect that we've learned as a part of not only revisioning our, our network and creating a better bus network uh, as one of the benefits and I would say the outcome of being nimble as a department through COVID is that we identified where there was an existing need that we otherwise would not be able to cover through our traditional services. And so we created a, a go nightly program which set up to provide supplemental overnight services on bus routes that really helped to move some of the essential workers uh, throughout the pandemic. And so we were able to partner with uh, ride-sharing companies, Uber and Lyft, as an example, uh, as well as a contract uh, that we had to provide on-demand services for uh, our ADA population and wheelchair bound population to provide on demand uh, ride sharing services between midnight and 5 a.m. So folks had a way to be able to get around uh, throughout the county. Uh, we limited the ability to uh, have this ride hailing services to 500 foot buffer within around nine routes and it was highly successful during that time. Uh, this is something that we're going to consider uh, maintaining uh, over the next uh, couple of years and, and begin to further integrate into the development of a better bus network. And so uh, this is an outcome based off of our ability to learn of how we need to adjust our service uh, and meet the demand and the needs uh, for all of our residents here within Miami-Dade County. So that just gives you a little bit of background of where we are and, and how we continue to adapt. So, so thank you. I'll turn it back over to you, Paul. Thanks, Julius. We appreciate it. And I'm sure the folks in those northern Miami suburbs will appreciate those 15 minute headways from the new bus plan there in Miami. Just as a reminder to those from trans agencies who are listening in, in the next few weeks, FTA will be releasing a notice of funding opportunity for our American Rescue Plan Route Planning Discretionary Grant. This grant will provide $25 million to agencies all across the country who want to plan new routes and new coverage to better serve the new and changing ridership following the COVID pandemic. We want to help your systems serve your entire community and to plan for the future of your service. So be sure to be on the lookout in the Federal Register for that notice of funding opportunity. We want to move now to Robbie Mackinnon in Kansas City. Robbie, many of us remember your eloquent remarks last time about creating a culture of commitment and belonging among the workforce at KCATA. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you redesigned your transit service to better serve your riders there in KC Mo and KCK? Mm -hmm. Um, a little bit ago, uh, I had an operator who she was driving her route and uh, as she pulled up to a stop, uh, people got on and off or whatever. And as she was pulling away, there was this young, young girl still sitting on the, uh, on the bench. And she looked back and for some reason, uh, being a mother herself and or instinct or whatever, she stopped and told everyone, just wait a second. Um, and everybody was okay. She went out, uh, got this little girl, found out that she was dropped off um, from a school at, a, at the house she used to live in, not the new house she's in, and she didn't know how to get there. Our operator being able to stop and, and understand that and, and be able to pick her up and make a difference, that's what I'm talking about, okay? So, so what would have happened to that little girl? Who knows? Like I said before, we have a hundred stories like that and so do you, okay? And these are folks that are our operators, especially during COVID that have been putting themselves in danger, okay? Uh, with virus, but still being ambassadors, count counselors, babysitters, uh, uh, peace officers, all of that, even during the pandemic. I, 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 
you know, I'd put them right up there with healthcare workers. Cause again, like I said, the, the, we're the ones, we're the ones that have kept, kept these cities breathing. All right. So when you talk about that culture, that's what I'm talking about. I think too often we get caught up uh, sitting behind desks and looking at uh, decimal points and, and numbers and, and, and maps on a whiteboard and, and whatever, and forget why we're actually doing this. Okay. And why we're doing it is people. Why we're doing it is that's our job. It's not aluminum, rubber, and everything else. It's about people. It's about affecting people's lives, all right? So that's what we're going to do. That's what we're doing right now. And when you talk about how you do that, we're focusing in on four pillars of public transit in Kansas City, all right? Access, access to jobs, education, health care, and housing. All of that on a foundation of social equity which is our, our zero fare program, right? So it's not just, hey, free transit, we're gonna give away free transit. It's, it's zero fare as a two sides of the same coin to, to having a fast, efficient service and, and actually going to where people need us to go. 75% of our ridership is our folks who, who need that help every day, okay? Who need to get to their job, who need to get to the doctor, who need to whatever. And if you can, if you can take those overlays from from education, healthcare, job access, and housing, and overlay that into building uh, a transit system on top of the fact that uh, you can do some zero fare, uh, then you're really then you're really cooking with gas, right? We started zero fare over here for the strictly for our operators to make our operators safer. 85% of any incident we ever had on a vehicle was because of a fare box dispute, okay, which is ridiculous, and. The, the amount of money we were paying to collect it, the amount of money we'd pay to, to, to redo our fare boxes, whatever that is, it, it just, it, it's ridiculous, okay? And, and as far as I'm concerned, uh, a fare is another regressive tax on the folks who need the most help. So by weaving ourselves into the community fabric, rather than sitting out on an island by ourselves, just talking about revenue and ridership, okay, yes, they're very important, but I'd say we look at that through a different lens, okay? Ridership is a byproduct. It's a byproduct of what kind of system do you have, okay? Do you have, do people have access and do people have options, right? The ridership will come if you handle those two things first. And from a revenue standpoint, I can figure out other places to get revenue, which is what we've been doing now. We've been zero fare for over a year and a half. Our incident rates have gone down another 35%. Uh, you know, uh, from a revenue standpoint, uh, we went to Blue Cross Blue Shield. They're helping us with a million dollars a year. The city has stepped up. Uh, uh, other private sectors in the chamber are stepping up because they're seeing what the value is, right? And then when you talk about, well, I don't know, you're going to, uh, I, I fixed the safety thing, right? But when you talk about, well, then the house lists are going, well, there, but by the grace of God, go us, right? Uh, and I'm not going to have my operators picking winners or losers. Okay, so I we adopted a plan just like uh, uh, Minister Fernandez did uh, in Chicago, where we're taking those safety net providers now and using them as outreach. They normally do outreach, putting them on vehicles so they can actually be resources to people, to folks who need help. Also at our stops, uh, where we used to have just uh, waiting rooms to where people could come in and, and cool off or, or heat up uh, before the buses came. Now we're putting actually the full employment council, the metropolitan community colleges, the mid-continent library. We're putting uh, partnerships with resources. That's where the people are. So we're connecting them with the community. It's about us becoming a part of the community, not just sitting over here by ourselves, talking about decimal points, ridership and revenue. And I think that is the biggest difference uh, in a culture change, if you will, uh, here in Kansas City and why uh, our ridership during when everybody else's was dipping down to 20, 25%, ours barely dipped below 60. And, uh, you know, now we're at 80, 90% and all of our service isn't out there yet. So it's that combination of putting, of putting, uh, uh, putting people first, not only the, your customers, but your, your operators who, who are salt of the earth, uh, putting themselves in danger and just doing wonderful things uh, of, of why we're being successful here. And I'll leave you with, um, you know, I'm sorry I don't have the, the PowerPoint, but I hope I'm, I'm making my point. The, uh, the return on investment for compassion, for empathy, for social equity far outweighs the return on investment for aluminum, asphalt, and concrete. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you, Robbie. And it's great to hear again, the great work that you're doing, weaving the, the yourselves and the community together and, and making a KCATA make a difference. We want to go down to, to Sharon Cooney with MTS. We were very much impressed by a lot of the ridership campaigns that you had launched during the very worst of the pandemic and that you continue to promote today. What is the process there in San Diego for developing an effective communications campaign? And at the end of the day, how do you measure success? Well, thanks, Paul. That's an excellent question that we've all been grappling with here in transit. Uh, communication was especially difficult during the pandemic as we had our traditional ways of communicating with riders, but we wanted to do it safely. So with the pandemic, just like everyone else, we had to pivot quickly as we are considered to be an essential business with the mission to get essential workers to their jobs, we developed a clean ride campaign right away. Uh, this was largely a digital campaign, but it was also supported by an outdoor campaign to show that MTS was safe to ride, but also to encourage the messages of proper etiquette of wearing masks and appropriate social distancing. Key to this campaign was our operational commitment to keep service le levels close to 100% so people really could maintain distance. And we supported our efforts with free ride days, both for election day and free rides to vaccination sites. In late 2020, we developed a campaign with small businesses to help people get out and support their local businesses. It was called Eat, Shop, Play. Uh, partnered, it partnered with more than 100 establishments, and people were incentivized to make purchases at these businesses. So when they got 10 stamps, they were able to redeem their card for a free monthly pass. This was supported by a dedicated website, uh, significant advertising, and especially from support from our board of directors. It was really another great way to keep connected and relevant to our communities. And our social media team endeavors to keep connected with our riders at all time. As Nuria mentioned, an example of the fun we had, the photo on the screen pays homage to the Star Wars on May the 4th. Next slide. Right now, we're building off the success of our previous campaigns to utilize our employees to welcome people back to our system. Because as Robbie mentioned, our employees are truly our greatest ambassadors. Uh, that will morph into a welcome aboard campaign featuring real riders who have come back to our system and are excited about riding transit again. But our major effort, which we're really excited about is our free ride month in September. Anyone who establishes a Pronto account through our new fare collection system will get to ride all of our system for free. Uh, this will give a lot of people an opportunity to try transit for the first time. We really have a lot of partners in this. We've been coordinating the effort with our institutional partners. Uh, we are working with school districts to distribute youth cards with universities and with hard to reach communities through partnership with CBOs. This is a major effort and we have had fantastic participation and excitement at our community outreach events with continuous lines and a lot of enthusiasm enthusiasm for getting back to riding transit. We expect that by September 1st, next week, we'll have handed out about 100,000 cards. It's also important to note that there are other factors at play as well. Upwards of 70% of MTS riders are transit dependents. So as businesses reopen and the tourism market returns, we're seeing riders come back. And special events play a role as well, as we're already seeing spikes during the Padres games. Uh, we've also partnered with the San Diego Symphony. They're newly opened concerts on the Bay. And of course, the big one, we're hosting large popular events leading up to the opening of our newest extension of the trolley to UCSD. Uh, ridership is already up 48% from where we were this time last August. So in conclusion, we're confident that our ridership recovery efforts combined with all of the exceptional opportunities to advance transit in San Diego will lead to significant gains in ridership. Thank you. Back to you, Paul. Thanks, Sharon. And thank you very much to Alex, Ulis, and Ravi as well. Sharon's right. As Administrator Fernandez has constantly said, during the worst of the pandemic, transit was the way essential workers got to and from the front lines and got back home. So thank you to all those who helped make that happen. For our second panel today, we'll focus on safety, which has taken on even more significance over the past 18 months, as Ravi talked about in his remarks. We'll dive into how communicating effectively about safety improvements has boosted rider confidence and sparked ridership renewal. 
Joining us for this panel will be Paul Wiedefeld, General Manager and CEO at WMATA, the Washington Metropolitan Area Transit Authority here in Washington, D.C. Kendra McGady, Director of Transit at Pelavan Transit, a leader in the Northeastern Oklahoma Tribal Transit Consortium, and a board member for the CTAA, Community Transportation Association of America, wearing a few hats here and there. And finally, Chris Van Eiken with the Transit Center. Thank you all for returning to share with us some of your additional words of wisdom. And Paul, we'll start with you. Right now, transit safety focus is bifurcated. It's on COVID response and also op protecting operators. When we last spoke, you noted the importance of capital investments in safety and a state of good repair. For instance, the 2016 Safe Track project here in Washington. Can you provide some examples and let us know how riders are responding to your efforts? Well, thank you, Paul. I'm glad to do that. Um, <clears throat> yes, as you mentioned, we started a program called Safe Track a few years ago. Um, just a little bit of background. Background, we had we basically had lost uh, credibility in, in the community in terms of our safety and reliability of this. So we really had a budget and say, all right, we need to get out there and really do the work. And that's what we did. So we basically went out and renewed a, a, roughly a third of our, our track system. And it was painful uh, for our customers because we had to do major shutdowns to do that. Uh, but they got it. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. So we built on that sort of concept. And now we currently have what we call the Platform Improvement Project, where again, we were having platforms that physically were, were crumbling under people's feet, creating serious uh, trip, and, trip and fall hazards. But more importantly, one day we were going to wake up and have to shut down stations just because they would have been unsafe. So we created a program, again, work with the public, work with the le local elected officials, work with the business community to explain the logic of it, and then basically started that, started that program. We're wrapping that up. Uh, we'll wrap that up next year and have that one behind us. Uh, next slide, please. You can see um, based on that, that effort, this is a, a survey that we don't do. Actually, the Washington Post does a, a, a survey uh, every year at 18 months. But basically, and, and the public, what do, you know, how do they feel about us? And as you can see, we had dropped dramatically uh, since 2013 in terms of reliability, in terms of safety, in terms of, again, the credibility of the system. And by basically being very straight with people, letting them know what we're doing, why we're doing it, and uh, recognizing that we have almost a 50-year-old system that needs these type of repairs, uh, we went out and did the work and have been doing the work, and basically the, the positivity marks have gone up. So that's, it just shows you, I think, when we, when we deal with issues uh, honestly with people, um, I think they get it and uh, they respond to it. And it's the same way we're dealing with the pandemic. Um, it's the same exact way that we're doing with that. We've had to do some things um, to deal with that, but I think the public in general does understand, understand it very well. Thanks, Paul. And obviously it's great as a Washingtonian to see Metro really get back to good. Of course, you are implementing the new COVID safety protocols. Can you highlight some of those and let us know how you're promoting those efforts across the DC Metro area? Sure thing. Uh, next slide, please. So there's a number of things that we're doing. The biggest things that we're trying to communicate is that, again, we're all in this together, meaning it can't just be the transit agency that deals with these issues in, in, you know, in our business. We need the public to be part of it. So, on, so we've created a program that says, all right, here's all the things that we're doing you know, as an agency to keep you safe. Obviously, it's the, it's the mass requirement. It's, it's all the cleaning we're doing, all the air filtration work we're doing. We're basically are going to be requiring that everyone either get, be vaccinated or get tested um, and show that they're, they're negative uh, on a weekly basis. Again, that's a communication strategy to our customers as well as protecting our, our employees. And so that's one sort of the things that we do. And we, we publicize that and I'll, I'll show that in a minute. But then also what we're asking the customers to do is that again, they play a role in this. So they have to, they have to you know, be part of this solution with us. Again, wear the mask, work correctly, uh, remain social distance where you can. Um, you know, really just think about how you can be part of the solution with us uh, as we try to deal with this. So we've created this campaign. We're ready to launch in right after September 7th, right after the holiday, to try to start to bring people back. So we're doing a number of things in terms of service, improving the quality of service, some of the things that uh, have been talked about here in terms of lower fares and, and higher or, or more frequent headways and things of that nature. So if I could, the next, um, the next slide gives a little bit of a, an outreach effort that we're doing. Eight million hands sanitized. One million faces protected. 
400,000 rail cars disinfected. We're humming right along, keeping you safe when you ride Metro. So again, Paul, that's sort of our, our doing our part and then asking the customers to do their part. So thank you for the time uh, to be able to explain what we're doing here in Washington. Thank you, Paul. We appreciate it. We appreciate all the work you're going to be doing to help bring the federal workforce back to work here in Washington. But we want to go on to Kendra McGady, who described a specialized training program for her workers, including new cleaning protocols and other measures. Kendra, how have you adopted the safety improvements and a safety first approach with your workforce during what has got to have been a really challenging time? Well, thank you, Paul, and thank you to the FTA for having me here today. Um, Rural transit is, is no exception to what we've all gone through as transit providers, and I would like to again appreciate um, giving us a little bit of a focus. I'm the director of Pelavan Transit and the Northeast Tribal Transit Consortium located in Northeast Oklahoma. We operate in 4,466 square miles and work with 10 tribal nations out here. I'm also representing the CTAA today, who I serve as a national board member for. Um, state DOTs um, support our safety programs here in rural transit. So safety has always been a top priority of ours, but as COVID-19 began to swallow up our systems and our ridership plummeted, um, safety became the focus, became more of a public health issue. Um, in rural transit and tribal transit, the, the trips that we were clinging to as our numbers fell were of the most essential nature, um, providing transportation to senior citizens and tribal elders to critical care appointments. Um, our, our driving staff is oftentimes um, a retiree age, so we had a lot to deal with um, as far as transporting these very vulnerable populations, not only as drivers, and, but as riders as well. So we, our approach to COVID-19 um, was swift and aggressive, and we immediately began to gather up every resource that we had and then implement protocols into our system to maintain a safe and trusted transportation environment. Um, we didn't make suggestions or recommendations. We immediately began writing these things into policy. And some of the things that we did um, were looking at airflow. We began to um, practice disinfecting our buses in between each trip. We installed barriers um, to protect a, a space between drivers and riders. We have gone to limited seating and continue to remain at limited seating. Um, rear entry was one of our uh, protocols. And of course, mask requirements for all drivers and all riders which remain in place now until next year. Um, in rural transit, a lot of people like to ride in the front seat. And that was another thing that we had to do away with. Um, it was a little bit of a challenge at first. We did get a little pushback from that from some of our riders because we offer such intimate relationships with our ridership here in rural transit because we transport the same people over and over, um, day in, day out, our neighbors and friends, which is why we had to take this so seriously. Again, our trips are very essential in nature. So operating under the strictest of CDC guidelines and finding out resources of what we could do to maintain safe systems was very important to us. In the state of Oklahoma, we were very fortunate that our state DOT did um, open up um, the state contract and collectively offered the transit systems in the state $5 million worth of PPE. So we invested heavily in those things. Um, fogging machines, we're now fogging our vehicles twice a week or once every two weeks, I forgive me, we are cleaning and disinfecting with disinfecting wands after every trip. We have provided PPE uh, in the form of masks to our riders um, continually. We have those on every bus for riders who don't have masks, although we've not seen a lot of pushback with that in rural transit. Again, I think that's because of the intimate relationship that we have with our riders and, and the essential natures of our trips. But we were able to secure the, the PPE that we needed um, through our state DOT and offer these things to our ridership. At Pelavan Transit, we also hosted vaccine clinics um, for our riders, uh, not, for our, not just for our riders, but we transported to and from uh, free trips to vaccine clinics. But we also partnered with our local medical clinic to provide um, vaccines for our staff. Uh, we, through that project, we successfully vaccinated 21 of our staff members, which we were very pleased with. As time moved on, we have offered incentives to um, individuals who have since received their vaccine. Um, and, and we've seen a very good uh, response to that. Um, the majority of our staff is vaccinated um, with the exception of one or two who are unable to receive the vaccine for medical reasons. 
I feel that the reason that we've seen a steady increase in our ridership at Pelavan Transit and in rural America, some of the friends and colleagues that I've spoken to on a national level, is because of the immediate response, um, the continual uh, persistence in cleaning and sanitizing our vehicles, and most importantly, communicating these protocols to the public. Again, our trips are very essential in nature. We're, we're transporting very vulnerable populations, and there's a big fear factor there. Um, so we wanted to communicate to them the best that we could what we were doing. Um, in addition to this communication, I want to talk a little bit about some specialized training that we um, invested in for our riders and our drivers. Um, atmospheric uh, high frustration um, due to lack of services, lack of access, um, and just isolation became an issue. And so thankfully the CTAA began to offer specialized training for de-escalation de and conflict resolution, as well as trauma-informed training for drivers. And, and we've participated in that. I believe that close to 400 people have taken part in that since COVID reared its head. And we're very pleased with that because we think that that was an issue and, and learning how to de-escalate those things and having um, educated drivers was very important. Um, as far as our communication, we did work with the local newspapers. We work with our social media pages and, and websites to create videos showing our cleaning procedures. And for Pelavan Transit in particular, we were able to utilize our technologies to inform riders of changes in service, um, potential exposures in the beginning, and just what we were doing as far as safety protocols in an effort to keep them safe and make them feel comfortable with returning to transit. Next slide, please. I, I wanted to show you a little bit of chart here that shows our ridership renewal. I think that because of the communication and the, um, the dedication to cleaning protocols and implementing these safety features into our system has been key to our ridership increase. As you can see for Pelavan Transit on the left side, um, post pre-COVID-19, we were offering almost 12,000 trips a month. And last month we completed 9,665. So I think that our ridership is steadily increasing. We're very pleased with that. And I'd like to thank you for having me today very much. Thank you, Kendra. We appreciate it and appreciate all the work you're doing both in rural Oklahoma and on the reservations. It's outstanding to see. We want to move now to Chris Van Eiken from the Transit Center. And Chris, the report you released was eye-opening. We appreciated hearing the results of a study on transit rider perceptions about crime. What do you recommend as the best practices for transit agencies to communicate about rider safety? Uh, I think, first, I want to say thank you for having me back, Paul. Uh, first of all, I think agencies need to have an open conversation with their riders and with the communities they serve. Uh, last year, Portland TriMet went through a process of reimagining their public safety program. And to begin that process, they held a series of community forums where they talked to riders and they allowed community groups from each neighborhood to lead that process. So riders were really able to voice their concerns about the current system and have an open conversation with TriMet and help them develop a better system that served their needs. I think agencies also need to report out safety statistics in a way that doesn't just focus on crime. So it's very important that we're frank about what crimes are occurring on the system and how we're progressing and preventing them. But agencies also need to talk about the things that they're doing to prevent crime from happening in the first place. And this is providing the social services that riders need when they enter the system. So we see systems like SEPTA and LA Metro beginning to report how many riders experiencing homelessness, for instance, that they're connecting with social services and helping get into housing. So that they're not coming back onto the system and causing recurring problems. Numbers like this help advocates and communities have a better conversation with their transit agencies when they want to talk about safety issues. And it helps to show that agencies are being honest and are coming to the community and meeting them where they are. I would also emphasize that transit agencies need to work not only as a service provider, but when they can advocate for their riders and make sure that they're speaking out when they see that social dysfunction is taking place in the system and creating you know, a place where homeless services or mental health providers are comfortable coming to the agency and asking to participate in their safety programs and being given the opportunity to enter the system and help and help some of the riders get these services that they need so they're not causing dysfunction for other folks.
Thank you very much, Chris. We really appreciate it. We appreciate everyone who shared those great details on what remains the most important issue for everyone, particularly here at USDOT, that of safety. I'm glad we were able to show some of the best tools to renew public confidence by communicating about safety protocols and system requirements. Before we move on to our third panel, we'd like to play a video FDA produced to demonstrate the variety of creative ways the transit systems have messaged about renewing ridership over the past few months. We've seen the best way to communicate with ridership is to present the overall benefits of their local public transit system. We hope that gives you some great ideas and thank you to all the FTA staff that worked hard putting that video together. For our third panel discussion, we wanna focus on the importance of partnerships between transit agencies and advocacy groups. We know national groups have a tremendous impact on transportation policy and we really appreciate their support and advocacy for transit projects. Today, we'll welcome to the discussion, Harriet Tregoning, Director of the New Urban Mobility Alliance, Zabe Bent, Director of Design at the National Association of City Transportation Officials, Joy Cheney, Executive Director of the National Urban League's Washington Bureau and Senior Vice President for Policy and Advocacy, and Tanya Adams, Board Chair for Compto, the Conference on Minority Transportation Officials. Thank you all for joining us again. Let's go ahead and get started. The panel represents policy and advocacy pioneers who have long and mutually beneficially partnered with FTA. Their work helps us look at the best ways to shape the future of transit. Harriet, we'll start with you. We were intrigued by your presentation about mobility hubs and getting more out of transit without actually having to build new lines. Can you flesh out some examples of where you're seeing the most effective transit exp expansion projects that haven't actually expanded? Thank you, Paul. Um, mobility hubs are a phenomenon. We're really trying, starting to see in many places around the country as communities look for ways to expand transit uh, and the transit shed without necessarily having to grow the footprint of transit service. One way to think about mobility hubs is a sort of next generation of TOD, transit oriented development, bringing together land use, mobility, uh, information, convenience, whether that's retail or services, all intended to expand the transit shed by giving people the means to get to transit or other destinations that are beyond what would be a normal walking distance. 
Mobility hubs begin with an understanding that transit is a part of people's mobility, but may not be all of it. Uh, in places where transit exists, it's often the second biggest mode share, uh, second only to private auto use. Agencies need to think about the people who use transit and how they make uh, all their trips and, and how those trips could be uh, smoother, easier, and more affordable through partnerships with other mobility providers. Think of what Transport for London does. This includes working on payment integration, on multimodal travel, and on the bundling of trips to make attractive pricing possible. Mobility hubs are often created with the idea that we've heard already many times this morning uh, of co-benefits of increased access to mobility in mind, something that this administration, the Biden administration is really focused on. How do we start to partner with NGOs, employers, governments, downtown business districts, and organizations that are looking to realize these co-benefits to figure out how increases in mobility can be paid for and, and policies with those partners really align. Next slide. So one example is San Antonio, a fast growing low density city that's looking to channel its rapid growth into new land use patterns and other strategies that are gonna get people to transit. They're looking at their own values and aspirations to locate mobility hubs in a way that address the problems caused by the city's current over-reliance on auto use, which includes limiting access to opportunity, increasing economic segregation and disparity, constraining wealth creation, like people having to make car payments, not house payments, and increasing vulnerability where they're finding lost jobs much harder to replace. The image on the right is from a workshop we did with the Urban Land Institute and via Metropolitan Transit, which is San Antonio's transit agency. We convened stakeholders to establish the criteria the city and VIA would use to determine the very best locations for mobility hubs to increase access to transit. Thanks, Harriet. And um, could you kind of let us know how a transit system can really take the first step to building a transportation sh shed and a mobility hub? Sure. Thanks, Paul. The first step for a transit agency is to find uh, uh, willing partners who can include existing and new last mile transit providers, service providers, the, the city or private landowners who can contribute land, and entities willing to contribute Wi Fi access or access to information about transportation time. That brings me to my next example on the next slide. Uh, Pittsburgh is uh, an amazing place and they've just launched an amazing program, Move PGH. Uh, it's a first of its kind initiative bringing together several mobility service providers that just got launched last month. Move PGH is the first initiative in the US to connect traditional and emerging low cost shared transportation options into a single easy to use system. Travelers can find a bus, a bike, a scooter, a moped, a car, or shared ride using the transit app or by visiting one of their 50 new mobility hubs throughout the city. Move PGH is built around the existing foundational systems of the Port Authority's public transit and the healthy ride bike share that already existed in the city and integrates a coalition of existing and new last mile service providers. Well, thanks so much for giving me the chance to, to give you these examples. Thank you, Harriet. We really appreciate it. We want to move on to Zave Bent. We appreciate you joining us today on behalf of NACTO, and we'd love for you to provide us with some more information about what you're doing to work on reducing climate change and promote equity, two critical issues for the Biden-Harris administration. What do you see as effective strategies for transit agencies to implement to help us build back better? And uh, Zave, you're muted. Seems like we might uh, might be having a little trouble hearing Zabe. Um, we can probably move on to Joy Cheney and then Zabe come back to you if that's okay. Perfect. So we wanna welcome in Joy Cheney. Uh, last time you spoke about equity and ways to improve transportation options for people around the country, particularly people of color who often face an uneven commute. We wanna, kind of have you provide examples if you can on where you see more equitable transportation systems uh, that, that are occurring in the country. Well, first of all, uh, thank you so much for having me. I hope everyone can hear me. 
Uh, my name is Joy Cheney, and I am um, the Senior Vice President for Policy and Advocacy at the National Urban League. And we are so glad. I want to thank you to um, the administrator and thank you to all of her team um, for putting up, for inviting us back. You know, when we answer that question, you know, one of the things the National Urban League, we are not a transportation expert. I want to be clear about that. We are uh, experts at ensuring economic um, empowerment and mobility for urban communities, urban centers, and people who live in those areas, underserved populations, traditionally Black, Brown, and Asian. We are focused on making sure those folks have access to an equitable economy. That's what we're experts at. And that includes in the workforce arena, almost two thirds of our 91 affiliates, National Urban League has 91 affiliates in 36 states, 300 communities, right? Serving 2 million people per year. And one of the things that we have found from that work is that the, 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 the fulcrum point for so much of the work that we're trying to do, whether it is political mobility or whether it is economic mobility, is transportation. Making sure it's just that simple, making sure you can get where you need to go. And um, there have been some really wonderful speakers that in particular, um, uh, Mr. Ravi, who spoke earlier, was particularly eloquent. It is that compassion and that humanity that has to be included in your transportation system and frankly has been lacking. Transportation redlining means that people are not able not only to get to work, um, but not able to engage and live the lives that all of us want to be able to live to simply to be able to get out of one's own block and to see the world beyond it. And for those people who are small business owners, making it difficult for folks to come into their community to utilize their businesses, which means that communities of color have been uh, cut off from economic opportunity and prosperity. And so for the National Urban League, we are out here, we're speaking to you all because we wanna see those barriers reduced and we wanna thank um, you know, the, the, the administration for its efforts, really tremendous efforts in particular with these latest brought, um, infrastructure packages to see about lowering um, those barriers. One of the things that we, um, our Milwaukee Urban League, um, we don't have many transportation programs, but we, this is one that is, is good. We have a Milwaukee Urban League who has a last mile program. And it is, it is meeting the needs of people who would like to work um, and would like to work in places where there are jobs, but there's just simply not transportation. Places that are 20 to 30 miles outside of the urban center. And there's virtually no way for them to get there. And so we're trying to make sure that they can get to their jobs, that they can get to their jobs on time. Uh, there have been instances where we've also, you know, for the most part, they come to a central location. They come to the, the Milwaukee Urban League um, location, but we also, you know, have come up with other uh, opportunities because of course it's about creating equity. Um, and making sure that they are able to get there. We've dropped people off uh, with daycare. We have, um, we've done all kinds of things to really meet them where they are. But we know that when people have jobs and they see jobs that are 20 to 30 miles, the difference between whether they can apply for those jobs uh, is having transportation. And what we have seen in response is folks who are incredibly employable, folks who are trained in our workforce development programs, who are, you know, uh, get uh, the advancements that they need to get the better jobs, and then they are able to, to access them because they have transportation to those programs. And we want to encourage transit systems to really think about where the jobs are and where the need for jobs are and making sure we close the gaps of doing that. Paul, any other questions? No, Joy, that, that fills up a lot of, uh, uh, of the thoughts that I had. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And we want to turn back now to Zabe Bent from NACTO. And uh, Zabe, I think we've got your technical difficulties solved. So we were hoping that you could talk a little bit about NACTO's work on reducing climate change and promoting equity. Yes, uh, hopefully you all can hear me now. Perfect. Perfect, wonderful, thank you. Um, so thanks again for inviting us back and for convening this, this discussion to begin with. I'm really excited to, to be here to talk about transit in uh, the current day. Um, we were asked to talk a little bit about climate and equity strategy, and I, 
First, I want to just say that our industry has been discussing safety and sustainability for years. We know that transportation represents the single largest source of greenhouse gas emissions, and the EPIC report shows that we are past the point of business as usual or marginal solutions, hoping we might get back to um, get ridership back to previous levels. Uh, we need systemic change. And in addition to the ongoing pandemic, we're facing overlapping public health crises, climate, safety, and equity. And we know that convenient, accessible, and reliable transit offers solutions to all of them. It's the reason that we think that transit should be the backbone of our recovery. So we also know that transit is part of a system. So we must encourage people to ride transit, not just by saying that transit is safe and open, but also that transit is accessible and efficient. We need safe walking and biking connections to transit, and we need transit service that connects people to where they want to go today. That means our focus and our systems must shift to full day, not just the peak period, and to destinations beyond the traditional office centers and hubs. Um, when we think about that today, barely half of, of Americans are within walking distance to transit. We've heard some of the speakers talk about this. Um, even in cities with robust transit options like Chicago, you can access seven times more jobs by car than by transit in the same 45 minute period. So we need to make sure that our traditional methods for evaluating tra travel patterns in the US um, don't just neglect our sort of ongoing trips. Right now, the majority of trips that we take in a day, the journey to work is just typically about 30% of all trips. And that means we're marginalizing the importance of connections to everything else, to all the other types of day and to our overall um, sort of quality of life. Uh, we're basically evaluating and optimizing transportation systems for nine to five white collar commuting. And that has led to disparities in who has access to reliable transit and disproportionately impacting communities of color and, and women as well. Next slide, please. We need more funding going to service operations. We need faster approval of transit projects, but we also can't improve transit access, access to transit rather without measuring and documenting its performance. Cities and transit agencies are doing the best job of refining their service are those that have and use a wealth of data, systems in San Antonio, in San Francisco, in Miami, in Pittsburgh, and many of those on this call. We need to make sure that those measures place uh, access to a variety of opportunities at the center of system evaluation and decision making. Uh, inequitable systems will not attract more riders. And in fact, we can expect to see ridership continue to drop if we do not address this issue. It's not solely an equity concern, however, but an economic one. Travelers from marginalized communities, those with low wage jobs, those traveling at off peak times are often those who provide critical or frontline services, healthcare, food production, goods delivery, and having them wait in long wait times, it can lead to missed appointments, it can lead to late shifts and even lost jobs. And that of course will cause riders to abandon transit for more reliable alternatives. So we need to make sure that our peak period transit commutes, um, which may become a thing of the past, are expanded. It's important to offer service to all day activities to maintain transit for shift workers and daytime or weekend errands as well. Broadening our focus will also allow us to serve both existing and potential riders to improve ridership and connect communities currently isolated by our transportation system to more opportunities. Next slide, please. And with that, we talk about creating a rapid bus ne network with frequent all day service with easy transfers and direct connections. Um, one example, Austin restructured their service by adding a rapid network and saw ridership increase 11% on weekdays and 32% on Sundays between February of 2018 and 2019. We need to see more of that even now um, in many different cities. Cities and transit agencies should also collaborate on how best to provide safe walking and biking connections to transit, to reduce transit delays and to improve uh, transit stops and stop spacing. It's essential to institutionalize the collaborations that we're seeing through data sharing agreements, through working groups, through cost sharing agreements to ensure that there's an effective and funded pipeline for delivering fast, equitable, and reliable service. Uh, bus priority projects provide the biggest opportunity here to expand access and ridership quickly. We're failing our transit riders in our systems by consistently directing close to all of the discretionary grants on light rail and subject, uh, subway projects. 
we need for, uh, to refine the criteria, uh, both USDOT and FTA, to refine their criteria and programs to prioritize more cost-effective improvements to bus service. And then finally, I'll say that we need to fund multimodal projects. They are proven to provide uh, safety and expand access and to make sure that we are limiting projects that are focused on roadway construction or highway construction um, that conflict with our ongoing goals for climate equity and safety improvements. With that, I will close. Thanks so much. And thank you, Zabe. Glad we could get you into the program today. We want to move to Tanya Adams from Compto, who also spoke eloquently about the need for equity and how to promote that in our transportation systems. Tanya, how can we create a more equitable transit system, particularly for those working extra shifts who need to get from point A to point B? And how can you connect community outreach to these service changes? Thank you, Paul. These are very important questions you raised today. For those who know me well, you know I've dedicated my entire career, over 30 years in making a difference in the industry centered around inclusion, diversity, equity, and equality. And as the proud chairwoman of Compto, I can attest to Compto's commitment to diversity and equity and inclusion for the past 50 years. This is what I love most about Compto, the dedication to its mission and core value. It is who we are as an organization. Equitable transit is one of our key missions. No one can be left behind or on the side of the road. We, Compto, FTA, and other entities must work together to make sure our low income people of color, elderly and our people with disabilities have the same access and mobility options that provide convenient, reliable, accessible and safe service. Creating an equitable transportation requires community involvement to identify the need of a larger segment of our population and labor force. Equity, equity can be a consideration for transportation infrastructure investment that accommodates non-traditional work schedules, second and third shifts, as well as walking, biking, ride sharing for those much needed last mile connections. Bolstering a disadvantaged business enterprise, DBE participation, community involvement provides foundation for establishing partnerships that identify and address transportation problems, such as last mile and service frequency, concerns of those who cannot afford personal transportation. An adoption of strategic policies that reduce congestion and travel times and support a multimodal network where travelers feel safe and assured that their trips can accomplish and get them to their desired place in the time frame that's needed. Finally, the outreach that promotes workforce development and partnerships with local schools and universities offer the opportunity to invest in our community assets, fostering long-term opportunities after a single project has been completed engaging with diverse group of educational uh, institutions such as HBCUs as a part of inclusive hiring strategies can create and change our communities and our families. I wanna leave you with a quote, one of my favorite ones from a DEI expert, Verna Myers. Diversity is being invited to the party and inclusion is being asked to dance. At Compto, we strive to create a community where everyone can contribute. Thank you. And thank you, Tanya. Thank you so much for bringing that, that point of view to the discussion as well. For our final panel discussion today, we've invited leaders from the transit industry groups and key stakeholders to discuss the best tools they've developed or seen to support the industry during these challenging times, ways that we can all build back better. Joining us for this discussion today is Paul Scatellis, president of the American Public Transportation Association, APTA, John Costa, President of the Amalgamated Transit Union. Jim Tyman, Executive Director of AASHTO, the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials. And Scott Bogren, Executive Director of the Community Transportation Association of America. I want to thank each of these gentlemen for all they do and to support public transportation across America. They represent organizations that are essential partners and that all of us at FTA greatly appreciate. Paul, let's start with you. APTA has been the go-to organization for transit agencies all over the country, providing tools and support throughout the pandemic. Can you give us a quick tour of APTA's latest and greatest strategies to help transit agencies come back even better? Well, thank you, Paul. Uh, it's so great uh, to be with you. And let me commend you and Administrator Fernandez and the entire FTA team. This has been a great session thus far, and I know we're, we're rounding the corner here with some excellent presentations uh, as well. 
Um, but let me just say, we're so grateful as APTA to have been able to participate along with you uh, in these le listening sessions. I know our members have benefited greatly from these discussions. Uh, it's been wonderful and I think just remarkable to listen to the previous panelists, to hear all of what's going on in the industry on multiple fronts, uh, all intended really to work towards helping the nation build back better. We all know that there's more work to be done uh, to reach the service levels and the passenger numbers that we're seeking to get us back to pre-pandemic levels, but that's going to take quite some time. And your efforts here at FTA and those of us who are engaged in this industry to make it better are working hard to achieve that. Uh, we know, first of all, that our, our patrons, our riders, simply want safe service. Uh, and that's something that we all have been working very hard uh, to do, making sure that the public feels safe and is protected uh, and is uh, going to be riding uh, at comfort and with confidence. We know this because we've asked our customers very directly in large and small communities all across the country. Uh, we've wanted to know what can transit users expect uh, and what would they like to know before they board a transit bus or a, a rail car to feel safe again? And they told us three things that I think stand out. First of all, safety on public transit requires a cooperative effort between agencies and riders. And I thought that was remarkable. Riders themselves really see that they have a role to play in this. Agencies need to show how they're enforcing COVID-related policies and official health guidance. And we've heard quite a bit about that today. And third, riders wanna feel empowered to make safe choices when riding transit. So they wanna feel empowered to make these decisions themselves. Let's go to the next slide. Uh, this, is, this is a good, uh, because of the customer feedback that we've got, we've created um, four pledges. Maybe we can go back, Paul, to the previous one just for a quick moment. We've developed four pledges uh, of our health and safety commitments program. Uh, and these again, uh, relate to what agencies need to be doing and what transit passengers and riders are doing. You'll notice that the commitments we've listed here are exactly the same kinds of things uh, that are, everyone is talking about today. They're not just talking about it in the context of transit, but in the workplace, in schools and in social gatherings. Today, we've got more than 200 agencies across the country that are participating in this health and safety commitments program. It's about 90% of our transit ridership nationally. That translates into helping people keep tens of millions of people safe each and every day. The program has been successful because we listen to our customers and to our frontline transit employees. And they're especially important in all of this, as we know. I wanna thank um, our APTA task force, which by the way, was created by Administrator Fernandez when she was APTA chair. We learned how to give our riders and employees what they needed. And this is an important lesson from the pandemic. So that, uh, that task force that worked in this effort really did some great work and in large measure uh, to Administrator Fernandez's vision and the work of many, many talented professionals across the country. We all know that the industry um, and the community is very diverse in transit, in the modes that we operate, the resources that we commit to services, and in the type of services that we offer. Our health and safety commitments program was designed to allow each agency to customize its implementation. And I know you've heard some of that uh, from Paul Wiedefeld uh, earlier today and others as well. We're very appreciative and, and really uh, gratified to see that the tools we've created, including the seal for public display, adopted uh, in a bright, wide variety of ways by agencies. And that's been something that's been very gratifying. Let me just give a couple of examples if we can move to the next slide uh, of what has been done. Uh, here are just two of those examples. In uh, Austin, Texas, Capital Metro, I launched an innovative passenger information tool that uses LED displays and includes ADA accessible features. Uh, the display helps the agency to share useful information and to reassure riders during the pandemic. And that's one of the things that we heard, how critically important communications is throughout this uh, pandemic uh, and, and what has been following thereafter. Another example, um, which you heard directly from Paul Wiedefeld mentioned earlier at WMATA, creating a series of uh, music themed video ads. And I think what was shared earlier was really a very innovative, very, very interesting one uh, that they shared with us today. But it highlights real-time crowding information, expanded mobile pay options, and the latest face mask requirements. The campaign's titled Doing Our Part, and it's being broadcast on local television and radio stations, as well as on digital and social media channels. 
And there's a lot more happening all across the country by agencies, again, many of which you've heard today, but a few other examples. In Salt Lake City, for example, a new pilot program is installing sensors on electric buses to provide instant information about air quality. In Los Angeles, LA Metro will pursue an alternative policing program that relies less on law enforcement and more on collaboration with community partners and social services. And agencies across the country are offering free rides, free food, and other inducements to get people to board a bus or train for a quick, easy ride to a vaccination site. And that's become so critical, especially over these last few months. Together with the health and safety commitments efforts, these efforts are helping to build confidence and bring riders back to transit. Another area I wanna to touch on is innovation. As we keep innovating, testing new ideas and asking ourselves what's working best, we've joined uh, with an outside firm to create an apt ridership tool. This tool provides near real-time ridership data. And you might ask, why is that important? Because it allows our transit agencies to use resources in the most effective ways, especially as circumstances and health guidance continue to change. You can see it for this, this slide, for example, uh, you can examine your own agency's ridership trend over various periods of time, pre-pandemic and through the pandemic to the current time. Most importantly, you can search for other peer agencies to compare against how your area, your metro area is performing against others in the country. It's not to say that one is better than the other, but it is to say, perhaps there's some lessons that can be learned vis-a-vis -vis one city or one agency to the next. And we're a great industry for sharing of information. So the true value of the ridership tool is being able to compare efforts, share information, learn from each other and build on that for our future success. This commitment is to continuous learning to continuous improvement because it's absolutely vital that we meet these new challenges as we move forward. Um, we know that the Delta virus has evolved, transit is evolving to deal with the challenges that we have. And by working together, we're gonna to be able to accomplish that. So we're in this together, never lose sight of that. It's how well we emerge from this crisis, which we will, and we're gonna do it working together effectively. So thank you, Paul, for this opportunity to join you and, and the talented group of individuals who've been presenting today. Thank you, Paul, and thank you for all the hard work being done by the folks at APTA. I wanna move now to John Costa from ATU. John, Administrator Fernandez has spoken to you and other union leaders regarding about the serious issue of workforce safety. You discussed the growing incidences of harassment and worse facing transit operators. And this issue really needs our full attention. Can you please provide us with your best recommendations for transit agencies to implement operator safety improvements? So it's such a critical piece to building back better. And thank you, Paul. And I wanna thank Noria for putting this together and inviting me on. Uh, I guess I'm gonna talk about our biggest investment, our workers, the workers, and the key issues facing our members and all transit workers when it comes to safety. They are assaults on transit workers, bathroom access for transit workers, blind spots on buses, air quality and COVID-19 on transit vehicles, emergency preparedness on the job, mental health and stress in the workplace. Next slide, please. Assaults, uh, not a week goes by that we don't hear about another attack on one of our members, our members are faced with death threats. They're spit at, food's being thrown at them. They're slapped, punched, even worse, killed. So solutions to deal with these assaults on operators include effective bus driver bar barriers. We need better barriers. We need safer barriers. We need a better workplace uh, workstation on a bus. Better channels of communications on violence toward operators, including threats, meeting with the union, talking with the communities, talking with law enforcement, identifying this, de-escalating training, programs that train operators how to deal with this issue with unruly passengers. Not only that, possibly teach them how to defend themselves like the airlines are doing now so they can protect themselves and not when they try to protect themselves, be disciplined or even fired. Bathroom access and tight schedules. Access to bathrooms has shown a major cause of stress and physical illness for transit workers. An ATU study found that 80% of transit workers say there is not enough time in their schedules to allow for bathroom access. 
The ATU solutions include installing transit facility hubs and allowing for quick access for restrooms, adding time to schedules to account for unplanned restroom breaks and increase schedule times to allow for adequate, adequate schedule breaks. Blind spots. We've been fighting this for a long time. The current American buses have huge blind spots caused by poor bus design with a massive A pillar and a large left side view mirrors. When a driver makes a left-hand turn, up to 15 people can be blocked by the blind spot. Pedestrians have been killed and injured by blind stocks and accidents, and our members have to deal with the stress and the mental stress of that happening, not only being disciplined. The ATU solutions includes, include buses with better design and no blind uh, posts. Buses in Europe have this. We've been talking about this. They use a visual, their visual has no blind spots and better batter, bat, barriers than we have here. Air quality for over 19. Air quality for COVID-19, air quality on American transit buses is dangerous and leads to increasing disease death among transit operators, including exposure to COVID-19 and diesel fumes, fuel, fumes, I'm sorry. Exposed to COVID-19, which has infected thousands of frontline uh, transit workers and taken the lives of 160 ATU members. Dangerous fumes. Transit agencies and bus manufacturers need to buy and design vehicles to protect operators and riders using barriers, MV13 filters, fresh air ventilation, and high efficiency filters. Emergency pre preparedness. In the wake of this tragic San Jose workplace shooting that took place of our nine members, lives, transit agencies and private transit companies need to implement emergency preparedness plans. A survey conducting the ATU in the wake of the San Jose mass shooting revealed that only 7% of local union leaders believed that their employees had an emergency action plan covering an active shooting situation. The ATU calls for FTA to require all transit agencies to provide and develop emergency preparedness programs that address the full scope of emergencies, including active shooter and situations. And lastly, mental health and stress on the job. Between ongoing pandemic, tight schedules, threats of violence, and the amount of concentrated attention necessary to drive a bus, ATU members work extremely difficult and stressful jobs. Transit agencies have failed to provide the meaningful support for those workers who experience mental health crisis as a result, result of their job. A tragic, tragic example in San Jose, one of our members, Henry Gonzalez, who took his life after suffering from trauma that endured after the murder of our nine and, and our, our union brothers and coworkers. We must make mental health a priority in the workplace, not just after the tragedy like endured in San Jose. We have to end the stigma around asking for help. ATU solution, transit agencies work with unions, develop to develop, identify, and offer a EAP programs to make mental health a pri priority on the job. And I'll end with this. You know, we can't go around saying that we uh, care for our workers, we honor our workers, they're heroes and all this good stuff and all this good talk and want to work with them. And then go to the table and propose taking away their pensions, privatizing their jobs, offering zeros and wanting them to pay more benefits. That just doesn't make sense if you're trying to gain the trust of the workers and talking about caring for them. Thank you. And thank you, John. Thank you for those wise words from the workforce. I wanna move now to Jim Timon. Jim, you emphasized last time how transit systems provided a lifeline in so many rural communities during the pandemic. Could you elaborate on that some? Thank you, Paul, and thank you, Administrator Fernandez, for including AASHTO in this critically important conversation. Um, AASHTO's members, the State Departments of Transportation, play a key role in providing the funding uh, for transit services across all areas and all populations, but specifically in rural and small urban communities, and specifically to people with special transportation needs, where transit absolutely is a lifeline. Early in the pandemic, many transit providers quickly shifted their primary mission from taking people to places where they can buy their goods and services to bringing those goods and services directly to those people. 
transit providers delivered life-saving medications. They delivered groceries to see others who were homebound. And in some rural areas, transit provided people with the only connection to the world outside of their home. And thankfully, many transit agencies, large and small, remained in service throughout the pandemic to provide transportation to those who could not do their jobs from outside or from the comfort of their own home. And I think one of the lessons that we all learned uh, during the pandemic, and we're still learning, is that while transit ridership is an important metric, it's really not the only metric we should be measuring. In many, community act, in many communities, access to goods and services is the more important metric that we should really be looking at. The second issue that I wanted to talk about, which is on the next slide, is, is, is safety. Now, we know that if transit is going to be a lifeline to these communities that I've been talking about, then our riders need to know that transit is safe. And prior to the pandemic, that meant that the safety of, the, of transit's physical infrastructure for most people. Um, state DOTs oversee billion, billions of dollars in transit capital and operating funds that are dedicated to that more traditional view of transit safety. Safety is the top priority for state DOTs and for transit agencies. And because of that focus, public transportation remains one of the safest modes of transportation out there. But as you know, the pandemic really redefined safety to include stopping the spread of COVID-19. And state DOTs and the transit agencies that we worked with really stepped up here over the last 18 months to help keep our transit agencies in operation by providing federal and state emergency relief funding, by working with transit agencies to, uh, to obtain personal protective equipment and, and uh, masks and other cleaning equipment, and providing guidance for retrofitting vehicles to ensure safe and social distancing. And when vaccines became available, we worked with our transit agencies to provide access to COVID vaccination clinics. And in some states, we launched mobile vaccination clinics taking critical vaccinations directly to some of those underserved communities. Thank you so much, Jim, for all of the, the, that information. And we wanna move now to Scott Bogren and piggybacking on what Jim said. Um, your presentation earlier was full of, of examples of how transit agencies in small urban and rural communities are serving residents through better communications and route flexibility. Could you please provide us with some of the best steps for transit systems to, to do this themselves and to help them build back better? Well, thanks, Paul. I really appreciate it. And uh, it's really an honor to share the virtual stage with so many great leaders all across the public and community transportation field. Uh, you know, the building back better, the, the, the emphasis area here, what we all are looking to achieve, um, it can't be done without effective leadership, resources and partnerships. And we've heard so much about that today. FTA has been a fantastic partner and, and uh, in terms of effective leadership, being able to get the resources out to folks as we've all been in varying ways combating uh, this global pandemic. Um, and, and FTA, uh, Jim and his group of state DOTs and then all the local transit providers all around the country They've all been engaged in those efforts. Um, I'm going to summarize because uh, uh, so much has been said here, and I am, am truly at the uh, at the last slot here. Uh, and I want to really summarize some of what we've been hearing to make sure and underscore. I think what are the key points, and it certainly overlaps well with what we've been hearing from rural, small urban, NEMT and paratransit operators, tribal transit operators. What we've been hearing from CTA's membership. On safety, that first bullet point, I think we've heard a lot about that, but there are two, two pieces that I, I, want, I want to stress. One is um, it's, it's one thing to do it. It's another thing to tell the community what you've done. And all systems and operators need to be very careful on exactly how they communicate what they've done to improve safety in this new definition, as many have mentioned, uh, safety. And, and transparency is critical on this, as is credibility. And the important piece here on safety is telling the safety story in a positive way. Public transportation 
is just as safe as it is to go to the movie theaters, to go to a restaurant, to do other things. And we need to be sure that as we communicate that we do that in a positive way. The next two bullet points on emerging travel patterns and building on existing and new partnerships really speak to what many uh, of my other colleagues here have talked to, relevance and ensuring that as we build back better, public transportation in all of its forms remains relevant. On emerging travel patterns and shifts, you know, three key pieces here. One is flexibility. If we're going to be able to react quickly and nimbly to where people want to go and changes in travel patterns and shifts that were brought on by the pandemic, we must be flexible. And I think it's really uh, uh, gratifying for me to hear so much about the value of the good old fashioned bus in all of this and its ability to, uh, from, from the better bus programs we heard at the very beginning of this, all throughout. And I, and I think that, you know, in these travel pattern shifts, the key issue is trying to determine in your community what is temporary and what is permanent in these shifts. The shifts are there, they've happened. How do we, how do, we do that? When it comes to building on new and existing partnerships, there are obvious ones with public health, uh, with emergency operations, with healthcare. We've heard also a lot about employment, but I wanna underscore the essentialness and kind of make sure that the partnerships and the travel pattern shifts are informed by what we've learned in the last 16 months about for whom public transportation is essential. And in some of these partnerships and in the travel pattern shifts, we're seeing new outcome-based strategies. What happens when that passenger leaves the vehicle, the job, the healthcare, independence, all the things that we know transit gives communities and gives our passengers. And I'll, and I'll echo what uh, Jim just had to say. We've often only defined public transportation's value by ridership numbers. And given the current climate, value over volume is gonna be important in the way we talk about what we're doing and how we make decisions. And this is really gonna be a critical piece. On the engagement, my goodness, we've heard tons about that. And, and you know, I think we all get inspired when we hear Robbie talk from KCATA. Uh, I really like what Zabe had to say about inequitable systems will lose ridership. How do, we, how do we get past that? We engage with the community. There's a lot of ways to do that. Uh, CTA members are telling us they're seeing things when it comes to um, dramatic increases in interest in zero fare policies. And I also think the incidental uses of public transit that Jim spoke to are another way to engage the community, uh, delivery of meals, medicines, and just as much as those things, um, having systems that can be there in emergencies, climate-based emergencies, uh, uh, cooling stations in overheated areas right now. Uh, unfortunately, we are reading the news and seeing a, uh, a, an important issue with a hurricane arriving uh, through the Gulf Coast. We know transit will, will need to be a part of the solutions. And, and, and here's the hoping that that, that that doesn't provide another major issue. Um, lastly, and I think importantly, the, the labor shortage. Uh, a lot of the questions as I've been looking at those throughout the day are talking about um, how do we roll out transit services the way we want without adequate labor, drivers, mechanics, uh, uh, systems of all sizes and CTA members are telling us they're seeing that. We've been doing a lot of training on sourcing and recruiting and retaining uh, uh, drivers and operators because it's going to be a critical issue and, and it's one that bears a lot of emphasis right now because we can't build back better if we don't have the right number of operators to get those buses and other vehicles back on the street. So, you know, it's a, uh, it's a critical time right now for the industry. We've got a lot of opportunities and we've got this great nexus right now between available resources and, and new important engagements with the community and partnerships new travel and pattern shifts emerging, and it creates this wonderful opportunity 
for transit to be relevant in communities. And that's really what I'd like to end on and, and turn it back to you, Paul. Thank you very much, Scott. We really appreciate it. And I'd like to as well thank everyone who participated in the lightning roundtables today and to everyone who took time out of their busy schedules to tune in and listen. FTA is committed to helping renew ridership across the country, and we know all of you are too. Today, we learned a lot about how the transit industry is taking stock, making plans, moving forward, and engaging riders. We greatly appreciate the knowledge shared today from some of the top leaders in the transit industry who represent just a fraction of the creativity and great ideas that we're seeing in the north, south, east, and west of our country from coast to coast. I'm confident that we can continue to work together to build back better. Now I'd like to turn it over to Administrator Nuria Fernandez to close us out today. Nuria? Thank you so much, Paul. I really wanna thank all of you, all our panelists. What outstanding presentations and thank you so much for sharing the great work that you're doing. Um, there was a great amount of best practices and I'm sure that your colleagues around the country are going to be uh, welcoming onto their own systems. It was also uh, an education, a showcase of that will help us get closer to our collective goal of renewing transit ridership across America. FDA really stands ready to help however we can by funding strategic uh, transit expansions, improving the state of good repair, and also offering the 21st century technology solutions. It is by creating the transit systems Americans deserve and should expect that we will see transit renewal. There is a number of sources that we're gonna be sharing with you, but before I close, I would like to draw your attention to FTA's National Transit Renewal Resource Portal. Uh, this comprehensive webpage features best practices, uh, which compiles a wide range of strategies we've heard from FTA's America's Open and Transit's Open, three lesson, uh, listening sessions including ridership campaigns, system design review, uh, restoring public confidence in transit safety, leveraging partnerships and ways to build back better. Uh, the portal also includes slides and recordings to all of our transit renewal sessions. Uh, we will continue to post uh, this information and all relevant work and studies on ridership renewal and feature social media from our transit partners. So please share this webpage with your colleagues and stakeholders as we want to continue this important national conversation and share the best practices and examples of how to renew public transit ridership. In addition, I also want to highlight our summit collaborators, all of whom have worked closely with us since we began this effort in July. A huge thank you to everyone who participated in our sessions. We asked for your time and your thoughts and you delivered. So thank you so much. Uh, there is information uh, regarding how you can contact us and it's on the screen. So I wanna just uh, say thank you as we end uh, today's session and encourage all of you to follow FTA social media accounts where we will continue to highlight ongoing best practices about renewing ridership. That wraps up today's activities and thanks again for joining us.